One of the ideas too that I that I'm thinking of is is also seasonality. So like you like mm-hmm. in the idea that you're not separate from your environment, like you are literally made up of like stardust and the animals <laughs> and the plants that you eat and the air that you're breathing and the water that you're drinking, right? So your environment mm-hmm. is making you. Welcome to State of Health Podcast. This is your host, Jay Mart. On this podcast, I will share my knowledge and experience as a personal trainer and health coach and talk about my interests and experiments in physical training, nutrition, and other lifestyle factors involved in health. On this episode of the podcast, I am joined by Kyle Cock, aka Trotting Sparrow on Instagram, to talk about the benefits of bringing your movement practice to the outside world. I've been following Kyle's Instagram page for around three years after hearing him speak at an online embodiment conference. Recently, Kyle made a post saying that he would love to be in more dialogue with anyone who's interested in order to refine his mental models. Dialogue has a profound ability to generate insight, help better formulate ideas, push us to articulate concepts, find relevant metaphors and common ground, or new direction through discourse and disagreement. I jumped at the opportunity and invited Kyle to come on State of Health. We discussed how complementary movement and natural settings can be, but also the importance of using a specialized environment such as a gym to enhance your experience in nature. An important concept that Kyle also shared is the seasonality of training and how he affords the changing of seasons to inform his personal movement practice. We finished off the conversation with Kyle explaining how to sit spot, the main core routine of Nature Connection. So if all that sounds interesting, then this podcast episode is for you. Just before we get started, this is a reminder that you can get started with my free bodyweight training program, Body Basics, which requires no equipment by going to subscribepage.com slash bodybasics. Also, if you're watching this on YouTube, don't forget to smash the like button for the YouTube algorithm. Hit subscribe if you like the content and hit the notification bell too. If you're listening through a podcast app, could you please share the podcast with a friend who may also enjoy listening and discussing it with you? All right, here's the episode. Hey, everybody. It's another episode of State of Health. I'm your host, Jay Mart. Today, I have another special guest, Kyle Cock, also known as Charting Sparrow on Instagram. Hello, Kyle. Thank you for joining me and accepting my invite. Yeah, Jay Mart. I'm super stoked to get the invite and I'm really trying to take advantage and uh, of invites and yeah, be more open and be in more dialogue with people. So I super appreciate you reaching out. Great. Uh, do you mind if I start with a little anecdote about how I came across who you are and, and then we'll get started from there? Yeah, please. Yeah. So I first, I believe, came across you at an online conference. I believe it was, it was the embodiment conference and you were giving a talk about how kind of like some of our social structures are really limiting the types of movements that we do uh, throughout the day. I remember like the one example that you said that really struck me was like, say you're like standing in line at like the grocery store and like maybe your like low back hurts and you got to do like a really big like circle to, to like with your low back to like make it feel better. But because you feel awkward with like people looking at you from like all circles and like giving you stares, maybe like that will restrict you from doing it. But meanwhile, that's the only thing that'll make you feel better. And that, that really resonated with me because at the time I was like taking the subway to work and I was that random dude on the subway that would like get down into a squat or maybe every once in a while even like hang from like the bars to like limber up my body. <laughs> and I was like, oh yeah, this guy, this guy knows what he's talking about. Absolutely. <laughs> and uh, from that on, I just found your Instagram page and I've been following and I just love seeing all the uh, cool different movements that you're, you're always posting on there and yeah, from right from there, I was like, this this is a person that I'd like to learn a little bit more from. Cool. Yeah, thank you. I love <laughs> hanging on the rails at the subway. It's like everybody, we should just hang the whole time. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's what they're there for. <laughs> Actually, a little side so, yeah, uh, story. Thank- I was on mm-hmm. a subway headed to the airport. And the pol- the security guards, the police officers, they actually played a really cool game um, in which they would free stand and they'd basically work on like ankle mobility. And there was a section um, 
uh, between two stops that the challenge was for them to try to like stand on that section without the feet moving or sliding. And I was like, this is an <laughs> perfect opportunity to get really great <laughs> movement skills instead of just sitting and letting the time pass. So that was really cool. I was stoked about that. Nice. Uh, yeah. Subway surfing. I, I think I've played that game every once in a while too. <laughs> yeah, but they were doing it kind of the lame way. They were doing it like, if the subway was going this way, their feet were basically perpendicular. And I was like, oh, oh, okay. the hard way is to actually be parallel. <laughs> and that you really yeah, yeah. get that like Tiddy Alice, <laughs> like rocking. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> you got to work up to that, I suppose. <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. So, mm -hmm. so like, uh, I guess that your, you could say area of expertise is, uh, nature connection and you're kind of bringing these two worlds of nature connection and wilderness awareness to movement culture. And so maybe we can just start there and talk about like, I, I have been kind of, I just watched a couple of your, um, previous interviews, just talking about how like those two things are so interrelated, you know, to be in nature, you need to, and, and do some of the things that you want to do in nature. You have to be really, uh, uh, you know, skillful at some of the movements and be uh, uh, flexible and, and, and I guess strong in some ways as well. So could you talk a little bit about that? Yeah, totally. So when I first started training at the wilderness awareness school, I was fresh from my office job. I could not squat. I could not really do a whole heck of a lot of anything. And um, I found myself moving through the world and getting lots of nourishment. And I came upon, you know, natural movement as a, as a kind of a, a lifestyle. And I really resonated with that. And, and I do believe in that, that natural movement um, is kind of the ideal. But for somebody like me and most of us uh, living in modernity, um, we're just not capable and so we need to find this strength and conditioning, this stretching, um, you know, whatever it is, so that we can then actually do the natural movements and get the full nourishment, right? Like if I can't mm -hmm. squat, I can't sit in a squat, I can't forage in a squat, so I need to go and work on my hip flexion, my dorsiflexion, whatever it is that's limiting my squat. And so I like this idea of going back and forth. Like when I was a personal trainer at the gym, I would ask people like, how do you know what to work on? And they're like, what do you mean? Mm. They're like thighs, tries, chest, leg, you know, I do all the exercises to get stronger. And I'm like, yeah, but like within the realm of like upper body workouts or lower body workouts, how do I know what workout, like what movement to actually pick. And that's where I think mm -hmm. your job, your career, and again, movement in nature can really inform that. So if you want to move through dynamic landscapes and like, uh, for me, like I like jumping, I like jumping from log to log and I find that my landings kind of suck because I don't, my, my shin angle is like really terrible. And so then I can go and pick an exercise like split squats to improve my dorsiflexion, to improve my shin angle. I can do something like tibialis raises so that I can build strong mobile ankles so that when I'm moving through a dynamic environment, um, I actually have that skill. So it's like the lifestyle informs the skills that I want. And then my gym practice gives me the skills to go and live the lifestyle. And then I'm in this hopefully reciprocal mm. relationship. So that's, that's kind of the big picture of how I like to think about it um, is that my movement and what I want to do informs my workouts and my workouts allow me to do the thing that I want to do versus just being like good looking and strong and fit. <laughs> yeah, that's very similar to how I think about it as well. Um, I like suggest clients to 
you know, pick an activity that they really enjoy doing because that's going to be their why they're going to be like motivated to do it. And they're going to be really, you know, actually getting physical, actually getting active and doing those things. But I say that that's not enough because if you just do that activity, you're going to end up doing a lot of like repetitive movements and, you know, you need to undo some of that by do, having a personal movement practice that helps nourish it and, uh, you know, take care of some of the repetitive movements so that you can actually do that activity for as long as you want to. Because if you just keep doing the, the fun activity, um, you know, it's, it, it's going to be, uh, um, uh, you, you might end up, uh, you know, not being able to do that a lot sooner had you not, you know, done that uh, additional stuff like you're talking about in the gym that can help you prepare for it. Yeah, exactly. And I think what I like about natural movement or just moving through the living world off the trail is it's like the broadest range of possible movement. So it can give mm. me the most information like, OK, well, I'm like going it's uneven trails. That's giving me information. OK, now I have to go over a log that's ooh, like, oh, I didn't know that. OK, now I have to climb like, oh, I'm not strong there. So when I move through a dynamic mm -hmm. environment, I get the most amount of information versus like if I'm mm -hmm. just like playing pickleball and then I just hone in on like, how do I get better at pickleball? Right. It's, it's, it is the same thing, but it's in a smaller window. So that's why mm -hmm. I, you know, and then there's all the obvious other nourishments of like being outside. Right. Um, so that's mm -hmm. why I really like, yeah. Natural movement is like the biggest possible frame of information of where I might have weaknesses or inefficiencies. And then I can kind of hone that list in a skill specific kind of mindset. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's very cool. Let's talk a little bit about, about like the, the, the nourishment of being outside. Uh, I heard you say, um, you're not separate from your environment. You are an expression of it. <laughs> I, that really resonated with me as well. Um, and so like, how do you go about, uh, you know, ex exploring like what, what is it that you like, uh, yeah. How do you, how do you find out that what, what, what do you need to do? Like, is it, is it simply that you have to by trial and error, like do the thing that you want to do and then kind of develop the awareness of what your body's telling you. And then, uh, and then go about like um, finding the right exercises that that overcome the limitations you, you find out about yourself? Or is there another way? Like, what is your method? Yeah, so yeah, so one of the ideas to it that I that I'm thinking of is, is also seasonality. So like you like mm -hmm. in the idea that you're not separate from your environment, like you are literally made up of like stardust and the animals and the plants that you eat and the air that you're breathing and the water that you're drinking, right? So your environment mm -hmm. is making you. Except mm -hmm. we live in this really weird time where most of the food we eat is not from our environment, right? Mm -hmm. And we have the mm -hmm. ability to modulate our environment through heating and air conditioning and clothing and all these other things. So we live in a really interesting time. Um, but again, you're not, you're not separate from it. Like you're just, you're trying to avoid it by like, Oh, I'm cold. I'm going to turn up the heat. Right. And mm -hmm. so there's mm -hmm. this idea, like Alan Watts talks about, like, you know, we think of our skin as separating us from the world, but it, it, it might actually be the thing that connects us to the world mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. so the way that i go about it is you can you can do you could go in either direction right you can like learn about something and then you can go and do it or you could do it and go and learn about it so i encourage people to do whatever mm -hmm. makes sense to them um but for mm -hmm. me it, it really comes down to like foraging so foraging is the thing that like, it literally pulls me outside. I don't actually spend like during cool. the summer, I 
really don't spend any time inside, but it pulls me into an environment, a curiosity about a plant or an animal that I'm interested in harvesting, like pulls me out into the world. And it pulls me into new environments that shows me what skills I have and might not have. So recently I went out and I was foraging cranberries. So I got to go to the side, beautiful floating bog, um, all this stuff. But I hurt my knee. I think I have like a partial or a sprained ACL injury. And I'm like, wow, like I, I can't squat. I can't bend my knee. And so I'm doing, um, a lot of like, kind of like forward folds. Right. And I'm like, ooh, mm-hmm. my hamstrings mm-hmm. are tight. I'm like, okay. Like, mm-hmm. kind of like mm-hmm. gathering this information. So then, like, when I go home and I want to stretch, I can be like, ooh, I need to work. Like, my hamstrings, they were tight um, in this activity. I'm also like wearing a neck bucket, like, filling. I'm progressive loading. Um, mm-hmm. So I'm getting all these kinds of nourishment. So when it, when I go into an environment, I get information and then I realize if I want to continue to go Mm. into that environment or be better suited for that environment, then I need to actually take that information back to the gym or the workout or the weight room, whatever Mm -hmm. it is, whatever you do. Mm -hmm. So it's, it's all about developing that, uh, awareness, right? Like, um, you have to develop the awareness, be able to observe, and then you can like realize and develop re- like respect for your body and understand the things that are required for you to achieve the things that you have in mind for like the goals that you want to do, such as foraging. Um, <clears throat> yeah, right. Like, so how, you, you know how, how you don't know that you're sore until you like move? It's kind of like mm-hmm. that. Like, if you don't ever move. You're like, oh, I worked out yesterday. I feel great. And then you like go to like mm-hmm. reach up into the cabinet and you're like, oh, okay. I'm That's where my soreness is. So it's a little bit like mm-hmm. that. You don't know <laughs> until you, you know, do something that, you know, illuminates it. Yeah. So you got to sensitize yourself to the environment by actually getting out there. <laughs> and then you got to be humble and respectful enough to like be able to observe the information that the environment gives you through uh whether it be like what you're feeling internally or it could be i guess what you're seeing externally as well like uh you know just uh whatever cues the the na- nature's giving you i guess uh and that got, I guess gets it gets back to seasonality. I guess the diff, you know the environment changes throughout the year, different seasons. There's different things to be doing. Um, is uh, how, like so. What? How do you go about like uh, structuring your um, your training based on like the different seasons? Is it like uh, just based on what activities are available to you, or is there something else? Yeah, a little bit of both, right? So most of us humans here that are listening to this probably live in the northern half of North America. And we have a thing. It's called Mm -hmm. winter. It is late, but it shows up (laughs) readily to kick your ass. And Mm -hmm. you can be prepared for it, right? So there's a word I don't know it, but there's a word in the Swedish and Norwegian culture for the cold training that they do at this time of year to prepare your vascular system and your brown fat and your mind and all of the system Mm -hmm. to be better adapted for cold weather, right? People just like sit in their Mm -hmm. 70 degree Mm -hmm. homes, you know, regardless of the temperature outside and then winter comes and, you know, they just bundle up. But you could be preparing for that, right? And so for Mm, me, like I'm in the river every day right now. Every day, every day. I walk down to the river, I go in the river and then I walk up my hill backwards and I get some good blood (laughs) flow into my knees and pretty soon I'm going to start my strength training. 
And so for me, Mm -hmm. like, I have like a, a seasonal practice. So the way that it looks is this time of year, I am reflecting and integrating all of the things that I've learned or tried throughout the year. I'm like, ooh, I heard about this thing and I learned about this and da 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 da. And I'm trying to boil those down to like the essence of what I think mm-hmm. I can practice, right? Because if you don't do anything, mm-hmm. it doesn't matter. So I don't need to do it at this like crazy high level. So for me, I've been mm-hmm. really inspired by Andrew Huberman's work and uh, Huberman Labs mm-hmm. and the whole, so like cold mm-hmm. training and circadian rhythm, right? This idea that mm-hmm. the light and temperature is dictating your entire hormonal processes to even have motivation to do a workout. And we have about 10 days yeah. left, probably less by you. You're a little further north than me, where the vitamin mm-hmm. D and all of the benefits of the sun are going to go away. <sighs> right? Absolutely. Yeah. And the darkness mm-hmm. is coming and we actually produce more melatonin throughout this time period. And so for me, I'm mm-hmm. like, I'm like becoming a little hobbit. Like I'm going to bed at like yeah. 30, right? And I'm waking up mm-hmm. at like seven, you know, right kind of at the sunrise. And so for me, I've, I've reflected, I've integrated, and then I boil everything down to like the core of the core. It's like, okay, circadian rhythm, meditation, time in nature, and then a basic strength training routine, right? And I'm not trying to like mm-hmm. learn anything new. I'm, I'm actually only doing things that I'm familiar with. And then I create mm-hmm. a space in the middle of winter where I'm like, I'm like bored of my routine. I like am not doing anything new or novel. And I create this void where I'm just like bored as shit, but I, I'm just like doing <laughs> the things on the list. Like, Okay, I have to do these Mm -hmm. things. And then when my new year emerges sometime in like January or February, when I'm like feeling the bubbling up, that's when I really get back into my parkour practice. I get back into Mm -hmm. like my jumping, my dynamic practice, and I'm starting to explore Mm -hmm. new things. And then once Mm -hmm. summer hits, I'm in like full go mode. My morning routine is Mm. out the fucking window. My evening routine Mm. is out the window. I am just like living in the dynamic freedom that is like the late spring into the summer. And then Mm. again, and then I'll learn lots of new things. I'll like try different. Oh, that. Oh, cool. Let me try that. Like, oh, cool. You got this plyometric Mm. workout. Like, let's do that. And then I'll kind of explore Mm. all of these things in a very disorganized way before I come back into the fall and kind of rein it back in. Mm. I love that. That's so cool. Very, very circular, very um, uh, like uh, just a interesting pattern and a couple of things that uh, speak, speak to me like uh, definitely uh, you know, getting into the, this uh, part of the year, uh, I, I am also falling asleep a, a little earlier, but I definitely see it more in my children. Like uh, they used to like, you know, stay up till a lot later, but now they're going to sleep so early. I'm, I have a little bit more free time now in the evenings. So that's kind of nice for me. <laughs> Very noticeable in, in seeing that part of it in children. And then I like what you're saying about, uh, you know, just boiling it down to some of the basics and then just repeating those over and over again. So like, I like, I like the fact that you're talking about the base, you know, just getting to the, what is the essence of it? And, you know, cause a lot of times the advanced thing that everyone thinks is cool, it's just the basic really mastered so well that like it looks advanced. And then I like the consistency of it. You know, like a lot of times it's like, you have to be consistent to actually gain the skill to, to, to learn it, to, to integrate it into your, into your body, to be, to make it a part of yourself. And then of course, yeah, you're going to get to a point where you're bored of that. <laughs> you, you need, you need to, uh, you know, change things up. And luckily 
time goes by and now you're in the springtime. So yeah, it's, it's time to change it, change it up and find something new. It, 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 it's almost very logical in a, in a way, isn't it? Yeah. Like, I mean, I think about, I mean, we live in such a weird time. <laughs> I often think about like <laughs> when you don't know shit, you know, and like just imagine that you're, you know, an ancestral hunter gatherer and the days are just like getting shorter and shorter and shorter. And you have no idea that it's going to get warm again. Right. And so there is. Mm hmm that you know that evolvability that that evolution that we've gone through um in that way and now we just live in a time where again like i can turn on a light right i can modify my environment and i could grow fucking bananas in my house full blue light i can my house can be 90 degrees regardless of what's happening outside and, and I think that's mm -hmm. leading to a lot of dysfunction. Like just because you can do something doesn't mean it's like the best idea or even a good idea. And so mm. like, I love technology. Like I love bumping my Bluetooth speaker. I love that I'm on a laptop chatting with you in the middle of the forest. Um, but mm -hmm. I've been listening. Um, I was listening to this podcast about limits like we, mm -hmm. we do not work within limits and we actively encourage people mm -hmm. to push the limit and go beyond and what mm -hmm. you think is possible. And that's exactly mm -hmm. how I fucked up my knee, right? I wasn't working <laughs> within my limits, right? And that's mm -hmm. when we, mm -hmm. we over harvest mm -hmm. things, um, we, you know, even, mm -hmm. even like energy, we like, oh, we need more energy. And I'm like, yeah, but that takes energy. Like, is there, mm -hmm. you know, can we find meaning and can we find satisfaction within limits that actually, like, I think that's like the deeper nourishment, right? Like mm -hmm. if you drink too much water, you're going to die. You're going to feel terrible. You mm -hmm. need to drink the right amount. Mm -hmm. of, you need to drink a, the amount of water that's well within your limit, right? Like eating food, you like eat mm -hmm. a limited amount of it. Um, and we live in a time where like we don't have limits. And I'm curious like how that is affecting us. Yeah, we live in a time of abundance and physical constraints are put aside. And it's interesting because what made me think is like a lot of times physical constraints are what we need to learn. And this applies to like physical training as well and skill acquisition. Um, when you put a physical constraint on like something that you're trying to do, you're actually better able to pick up that skill. I find like this could apply to handstands or something. Like if you're just like trying to kick, kick up to a handstand all the time, like you're going to have a hard time learning that. But if you put some physical constraints on what you're actually going to be doing, like maybe you're just going to go up, hold for a second and come back down instead of trying to hold for a max hold every time you're, you're kicking up, you're actually going to pick up the skill a lot faster and it's going to be better for you in the long term. Yeah, that's actually the, the question I've been asking. So I, I really believe in the constraint-led approach. That's mostly how we teach a lot of our workshops. Um, but I'm like, keep asking myself the question, like, what's the difference between a limit and a constraint? You know, mm. I don't know. Yeah. <laughs> I feel like within a set of constraints, I can, like, do so much. But... Like, yeah, you can use your creative it. mind. Yeah. So that's just, that's a curious, that's an answer I don't have. It's just a curiosity. I was, I was chatting out with somebody about that same thing. Cause I'm like, constraints <laughs> are amazing, but a limit is like a, a clear end. Like, oh, cool. Mm. Like you're in a place like you can harvest, you know, as many as you can find versus like a limit. Mm -hmm. It's like you can harvest 100 and then you're done. So mm -hmm. that's, that's a curiosity I have. Um, 
And can we find yeah. more nourishment within the limits as we yeah, still work within the constraints? Is it is it possible you can you can increase the limit by working within certain constraints? Let's talk about like let's say um like doing a squat a uh, barbell back squat, like doing the, the max, like one rep max, like there's a limit to how much you can do it. But if you force your training to be within certain constraints, then possibly you can increase the limit to which you can push your one rep max to. Yeah. But now I'm also like, I does that, does that similar, but I'm like, I don't want to push the limit. I want the limit to like mm. be, um, so yeah, the example that I gave, like I was out harvesting cranberries and I filled my neck bucket. That was mm-hmm. my limit is once the bucket is full, mm-hmm. I'm done. And for me, it wasn't even about mm-hmm. getting more berries or increasing the limit. Like I could have brought more buckets. I could have brought another bucket. It was like by having a limit, it first got me into the space. And now I'm, now I'm creating a, a relationship with that space. And once the limit was reached, then like me and my friend, like we took a nap and we went swimming. And so we were getting all these other forms of nourishment and creating more meaningful relationships with the other parts of that mm. space. So by like have like mm. once I reached the limit, then I was actually able to like deepen into the experience versus like trying to get more, um, you know, oh, I need more berries. I need more. I could sell these like, oh, my God, I should cultivate these. Like, <laughs> no, like I have the limit. So then I can actually deepen into the, the thing that's nourishing. And that's the meaning and the relationship. Um. Mm-hmm. So I would think about that even yeah. in like the gym, like, cool, I've reached my limit and now I can like chat and hang out and, well, you know, like again, mm-hmm. deepen into it versus trying to do more. I guess that's how I relate to that. Yeah, absolutely. And maybe let's like relate that to health a little bit because uh, like, yeah, if you, you if you're maxing out the limit every time, then um, it's almost like you're burning the candle at both ends kind of deal. And, you know, you're, you're going you're gonna to run out, <laughs> run out sooner. And so it's not the best thing for your health necessarily to be reaching that limit every time, right? Like uh, whether it's, uh, you know, pushing a, like extreme in- intensity every time you're working out, like you're just going to wear yourself out. You're going to get to a point where, you know, whether you, it's you cause an injury or just, just get demotivated uh, psychologically because it's hard to keep pushing that intensity so hard every time. Right. Yeah, exactly. Like most people I would argue are under recovered. <laughs> right? People prioritize like working out and intensity and, but most people are like, you know, like just go to bed a little bit earlier. Like your sleep is incredibly important for you to even get the effectiveness of your workout. Um, Mm -hmm. things like that. So that's where I like, um, really want to like drive people and, and like, that's all like the nourishment, right? Like being outside is so nourishing, to your hormonal system, your mm-hmm. neurotransmitter system, you're picking up electrons, you're ex- you're putting yourself in a sympathetic state, right? And so I think like yeah, I think that's why I'm really like the the broader spectrum and I think most people can get a lot of benefit, you know, spending one day in the gym doing uh, a more specified workout and just spending more time walking and being and nourishing the other parts of their health. Right. Mm-hmm. Like, Do you think that's like a missing key, missing link in people's like, uh, uh, I don't know, I guess uh, goals for, for, for improving their, whether it be like physical well-being, 
mental well-being is is that a missing link and like you know we think like oh because humans are sedentary now we need to force ourselves to go to the gym to get like this movement in but is is the gym really the the best environment for 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 accessing that yeah it's like you know it's it's a great tool and and i think we're confusing mm-hmm. tools with crutches right it's like my smartphone right it's an amazing tool mm-hmm. and it is also like ruining my spelling and draining my dopamine <laughs> and distracting me like shoes amazing tool when i put shoes on i'm amazing i can jump and flip and run and go across rocks and mm-hmm. I don't want to, I don't want to not be able to do anything when I take my shoes off. Right. And I think mm-hmm. that's the confusion is like people think, right. Like Katie Bowman has this really great idea of like, you have workout clothes. Okay. And then that means if you have workout clothes, you have not workout clothes. So you have <laughs> funneled all of your movement and health and you have put it into the hands of the gym you basically like have foregone your responsibility like if the gym closes like what are Mm -hmm. you gonna do right like during covid Mm -hmm. like all these people are like overweight and all of their movement outlets have been taken away from them Mm-hmm. Yet nature's just like chilling the whole time. Like, hey, like you can come out mm-hmm. inside. It's pretty safe. Um, mm-hmm. So that's why, again, I like a movement rich lifestyle where you spend a lot of time walking and moving in dynamic mm-hmm. terrains. But because mm-hmm. of the world we live in, like you do have to go to the gym or in order to expand the possibilities because like I like natural movements just not going to do it for you because you're Mm -hmm. so compromised, right. That you need Mm -hmm. to work out Mm -hmm. (laughs) to to move the needle. But Mm -hmm. again, their reciprocal Mm -hmm. relationship. And, and I think of like, I was super resistant to going to the gym for a long time. I'm like, dude, I can get everything I need in nature. And I was mm-hmm. like plateaued. I was had some like elbow tendonitis, some like knee stuff going on. And then I went to the gym. I did like 12 weeks in the gym. And I was like, I'm a beast. Like I can. And then I went back to my natural movement practice. I'm like, I can jump farther. I can like uh, run faster. I can squat. I can move in low gates. It was like all these things were revealed Mm. to me and my affordance in Mm. the landscape increased. And then that made me want to go to the gym, right? And it's like, I don't like Mm. this thing, but when I do this thing, it affords me all of this opportunity for meaning and nourishment in my environment. And so that's where Mm. I think, um, like you said, mm-hmm. having the thing, like what is the why? And my hope for mm-hmm. people is their why is just getting outside and being able to interact mm-hmm. with the living world. And it doesn't have to be tied to a mm-hmm. sport. doesn't have to be tied to a, a, a specific thing. It can just be like, I actually just want to like walk around and look at the world and interact with it. Like that would be like my basic mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. I was going to wear my, the gym is everywhere t-shirt, but I, it was too, it was dirty. So I couldn't wear it, <laughs> but uh, I like what you said. It is a tool going to the gym and like every tool you use, it has, it's the, you, you, you can use it for the right job or you can misuse it. Right. Like, so, uh, if you, yeah, if you, as long as you're mindful about how you're using it, why you're using it, then yeah, you can, you can make some gains. You can, you can actually improve that thing that you're, the, your why, the, the activity that you're really drawn to. You can get so good at that by using this tool to help you 
help, help you get there, help you, help you improve whatever it is that you're lacking at the moment to actually, um, you know, get good at that thing. <clears throat> yeah. Is there really like total. something? Yeah. Um, yeah. I just comment like, you know, and it's a hurdle. Like I recognize that in the beginning it sucks and it's hard. And the hope is that you have a positive experience that allows you to have positive experiences and it can like build on each other. Mm -hmm. What's your favorite thing to do in the gym? Like once you're there, um, what is my favorite thing to do in the gym? I really, one of the things I like doing is I like setting up ridiculous setups um, for the weird exercises <laughs> that I want to do. Um, so like me and yeah, my yeah. buddy, we were personal Freak trainers. people out. Yeah. We were personal trainers at this rock climbing gym <laughs> and we would spend like a good, like, you know, we we're there all day. So we'd spend like good amount of time like doing monkey and bear and ant, all these kind of like animal forms, like across the whole gym. Yeah. And then what I, mm-hmm. what I like to do is I like to make ridiculous setups for Nordic curls because nobody's doing. Oh, that. nice. Yeah. Yeah. Because uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And all, yeah, you, you can like, as long as you have some sort of uh hard to move object, I guess that can, uh, that your legs can fit under, <laughs> yeah, so then you, take like you, can, a... you can do them, I suppose. And yeah, I take like a bench with like the like glute ham curls or whatever they are. You load that up with weight mm-hmm. so it doesn't move. And then you have to like bring over yep. like a boat suit mm-hmm. ball, you know, and like whatever it is. Mm-hmm. And people are like, what, what are you doing? <laughs> <laughs> That's cool. It just makes people think, I guess, because uh, then they can see something that they've never seen before. They're like, whoa, what, what do they know that I don't know? <laughs> Oh yeah, I get maybe all, I should try that myself. What are you doing? People ask me all kinds of questions. Mm-hmm. <laughs> <It's> like, <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know, man. Mm-hmm. I'm fucking around. <laughs> what about? Um, let's talk a little bit about flexibility. I feel like that's a thing that gets uh, totally uh, forgotten in the gym. It's all about you know bench, deadlift, squat, or whatever, and no one actually uh, thinks like to. Uh, do some stretching pre or post. <laughs> and then of course, like if you want to go out into the nature, like we we're talking about and forage and explore and do the, do these things, you need to be flexible. You need to be able to get into like little nooks and crannies, or you need to be able to reach up to the bre- tree branch that like, uh, <laughs> you know, that's way up there. Like, uh, is there um, any tips or tricks or like your, how do you go about uh, increasing your flexibility? Yeah. Can you define flexibility? What is your definition of flexibility? A range of motion. Okay. Um, yeah, I just, I, there's a lot of like talk like flexibility versus mobility, you know, and um, people have lots of different thoughts on that. Yeah, so no. I'm going to, I'm going to keep it super simple. I'm not going to like try to yeah. give like the right answer. But the way that I think about it is mm-hmm. is basically like I like the progressive loaded stretching method. So this idea yeah. that I'm going to use weight to help me get into a further range of motion that I might not mm-hmm. be able to get into otherwise. And then I'm going to exert yep force or demonstrate strength at that end range of motion so that I can get out of it. Mm -hmm. So like Mm -hmm. a lot of people think about like, like passive stretching and like, I think stretching is great. So there's like, there's passive stretching, there's dynamic stretching, there's proprioceptive neuromuscular facilitation type of stretching. There's, um, what's the like, um, when you like bounce, what is that called? Um, ballistic stretching. Ballistic. Yeah. And I think 
I think for me, I'm like a minimalist. I'm like, how do I get the most by doing the least? And so I look at sure. uh, progressive loaded stretching as a way to develop f- flexibility and mobility. So demonstrating strength at my end mm-hmm. ranges of motion. And I actually use like mm-hmm. more traditional style stretching in the evening as a way to relax mm-hmm. and be in relationship mm-hmm. with my nervous system. I don't, I don't do it to mm-hmm. get more flexible. I do it to like mm-hmm. just know where my limits are or how my body is doing mm-hmm. um, or not doing. Mm-hmm. So yeah, so like, um, you know, split squats are a great example. I'm getting, I can use weight or elevated front foot to get me into the deepest range of motion because I have shitty dorsiflexion and I just mm-hmm. can't get there unless I load up like half my body weight in some dumbbells and elevate mm-hmm. my front foot six inches. All of a sudden now I'm getting into a range of motion that I can start training in. Mm-hmm. Um, mm-hmm. And so that's how I think about flexibility is like, how do I get stronger at my end range of motion with a weight so that when I don't have a weight, then that range of motion is like really easily accessible. Yeah. Very cool. That's very similar to how I think about it as well. Uh, yeah, I've, I've uh, started to use my kid as the weight, like to. So if I'm doing like a forward fold, I'm like, "Hey, get on my back, kid." <laughs> There's that, and then also like what you said, I do like using uh, stretching as a as an assessment tool, uh, mm. like and and a relaxation tool. So you, I do use it in the end of the night to relax a little bit and assess where am I at? Am I feeling good in this position? Am I feeling more? Uh, stiff than normal or is this all of a sudden oh whoa look at that i'm all of a sudden able to reach a little bit further than i'm than i used to oh i must that that uh loaded stretching might must be working Mm -hmm. um yeah so it's a it's this very cool versatile tool that could be used in so many ways uh, and is oftentimes forgotten in the gym unfortunately and a kid is like the best possible load like talk about progressive loading Right, like, uh, yeah. Bowman, <laughs> or, like she never, she only ever like holds her children, like never put them in a stroller, never, never use like the swaddle thing, like she's super hardcore. But like, the baby's really <laughs> light yeah. in the beginning, and if you hold that baby every mm-hmm. day, like the idea is that that baby gets heavier, you get stronger. <laughs> Right. Like I even love, Mm -hmm. um, I used to teach a lot of children and like, I love fighting children. Okay. This might sound a little weird, but (laughs) when you like, like children are so slow, right? So when they like go to hit you, you can very easily move out of the way, but as they get incrementally older, you have, your skill has to go up with that and i think like i think about that um like historically is like that like raising a child was the most natural way to both improve in skill and strength at like the most perfect time probably i would imagine like the way a child puts on weight is like somehow there's a probably some science out there that's like actually if you look at the strength curve and you look at the amount of weight a child puts on growth curve years, there's like a there's like a, a symbiotic relationship in that yeah that's that's the whole uh, myth of milo right the the uh, milo got stronger by carrying his calf every day and the calf turned into a big bull at the end of it. And Milo was super strong <laughs> when uh, he had to carry the bull because he got uh, progressively, uh, that's the, that's the whole myth behind progressive overload, right? The, the, that's exactly. how I like to tell the story to my clients anyway. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, exactly like that. Oh, like I feel so, I don't know if it's like bad. Like when I see people like, who like pawn their children off. Um, I'm like, 
<laughs> Dude, like a child is such a great training partner. Um, maybe not your child mm-hmm. is the best for you, but again, I think I think there's something in there and something missing. Because like when I go to the playground and do parkour, all the kids stop and look at me. And they're like, whoa, like an adult is doing something I don't see adults do. And it like piques their curiosity. And again, we can be in right relationship with that. Um, we're like, wow, like I'm really good because these kids kind of suck. So I feel better about how good I am mm-hmm. versus if I'm always comparing myself <laughs> to like Instagram and other adults, then I'm like, wow, I suck. And all these people are really good. So there's like a leveling (laughs) there with age um, that I think is like really humbling and really just natural. Mm -hmm. um, I think we should, Mm -hmm. yeah, lean into that a little bit more. Mm -hmm. What drew you to parkour? Um, So when I was doing all the natural movement stuff and moving through the woods, I was like, this is cool, but like, I don't have skill. Parkour to me was like the skill of moving through the woods and in the most efficient manner and, and really fun. And so, yeah, as I, I was training in the woods, I was doing all these like games and animal forms and I was learning about this and parkour was like, Oh, this is how you do do it at high level. Yeah. It's integrating the skills into like a codified almost manner, I suppose. Yeah. And, um, I've been really like on a search of like, where do I see parkour in the modern world? Um, Mm -hmm. and so like I've worked on farms, I've worked construction, I've done a lot of different jobs and like getting in and out of a truck step vault. Right. Like, um, putting in a hardwood floor, yes. monkey form, right? Mm-hmm. Like being able to like go up, over, down, and under, and through things, um, like scaffolding in housing, and all these things that like I find, I find parkour in more places, or it it gives me more options. Um, so mm-hmm. I think parkour is like actually makes your brain work. Good. Sorry, what was that? Really makes your brain work, I guess. Uh, like seeing all these uh, options that are available to you uh, when you're, you know, just doing your day to day activities, and then uh, you're like, okay, I could, I could just do this like a regular person or I could, uh, you know, just uh, practice real, this real cool skill and like integrate it into my day. Yeah. And that's kind of how I feel right now. So like when I was working a carpentry job, I was doing parkour all the time. Right. In, in all of these little ways on Mm -hmm. the job site. And now that I have this knee injury, I feel like a regular person. Like um, there's this like (laughs) deck behind me. And like, I could just walk off the yeah. deck and do a, a step down vault, right? And so I can, and <laughs> yeah. it's easy for me. I'm well practiced in it, but because of my knee, I actually have to walk around and like take the stairs. Um, So that's mm-hmm. where I see like parkour's ability to enrich your life because it gives you mm. way more options for both like efficiency mm. And then opportunity to interact um, with the world around you. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and I think of like that really applies to movement in general. All sorts of different like uh, styles of movement, you could say. Like, it's just you gotta look out for it and see the opportunities when they present themselves. Like, um, you know, you could, just a basic example. Like, you could uh, just put your socks on normally, or you could single leg balance while you're putting one sock on, then switch sides and single leg balance on the other side while you're putting the other sock on, like, why not do that? (laughs) It's like, then you're just, uh, you know, you're doing a little bit of training while you're doing your day-to-day stuff that you would be doing anyway. And, you know, then maybe you don't have to spend as long in the gym doing that. (laughs) 
Yeah, exactly. And again, a movement which lifestyle, you know, I would love to have a job one day where I help people like build their home and design their home that is actually conducive to their health versus like having huge detriment on their on their health. Like people build the mm-hmm. most ridiculous houses that mm-hmm. and spend money in ways that is like is really you could just modify a little bit like it doesn't even cost it cost you less money probably but you could have a super Mm -hmm. cool house that actually allows Mm -hmm. you to be the most functional version of yourself that cuts down on your gym time increases your Mm -hmm. lifespan your longevity your general quality of life you know like the classic Mm -hmm. example is and i have friend it's both an example that's universally used but i actually have a friend who told me about this is like his grandmother was on the second story of the house. And because she was old, the parents wanted to move her down to the first story of the house. And she knew Mm. that as soon as she would Mm -hmm. move down to the first story of the house, she would lose the ability Mm -hmm. to actually go up the stairs because that little bit, that daily repetition of doing the stairs was so beneficial for her mm-hmm. um, and i would love Absolutely. us to see like slight it would be like i want you to slightly inconvenience yourself for the betterment mm-hmm. of your longevity and physical health right like stairs yeah you know climbing in like people who have to climb a ladder to get into their bed right like whatever whatever it is you know um, mm-hmm. like, just put monkey hey, bars everywhere in your house oh my goodness i have i don't know why i <laughs> don't have monkey bars it's so crazy like as a kid monkey bars like every kid can do monkey bars and then when you become adult you suck at monkey bars mm-hmm. like, I'm, I'm trying to convince my wife to like let me hang some rings from like the second floor down to the first floor where the stairs start <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I bet you put like, I don't know how old your child is, but I bet if you put that baby on the rings, that baby can hold itself. My three-year-old can hold himself from the rings uh, for sure. He's uh, he's having fun swinging back and forth on them. Right. But then you have like 80% of 30-year-olds can't do that. So that's like, again, like... Mm-hmm maintaining it for as long as possible, but then we've lost it. So then we need to access the tools to get it back. Right. Um, and that's, mm-hmm. again, a baby's always mm-hmm. crawling. Kids are crawling, moving in low gates, squatting. So we've lost it. Yeah. Now yep. we also have tools to get it back. And that's really the big encouragement um, for people is like, mm-hmm. it's okay that you suck. Like, it's not your fault. Like we don't, we're not shaming mm-hmm. you. It's okay. We've all been there. Like I was a software guy for like three years. I still have a terrible squad, mm-hmm. but you can mm-hmm. get a little bit better by using the tools and the resources that are available to you. Yeah, I was there too. I was, uh, I had an office job. And uh, I was sitting so such a large portion of the day, had weak grip strength. One time I got out on the monkey bars. I couldn't make it across. It was such a wake up call for me. I was like, what are you doing? <laughs> and uh, yeah, turned it around since then. Thank God. But uh, yeah, it's a common story. And like I, what I really like love about you and your story is just like the integration of all this movement culture with the nature connection and and wilderness awareness maybe we can just finish finish off with that a little bit we're coming up on an hour and uh, just like maybe could you talk to me a little about um nature connection and like what i i guess maybe i think if i ask you like what is the first thing someone should could do to um to be what more better connected with nature you you would say like just get out there and uh and just observe right I think you, you call it sit spot. Maybe could you, could you tell me a little bit more about that? And like, 
like what what is your mindset when you're sit spotting are, are you like because a lot of times people will have like all these thoughts going through their heads like their to-do list they're <laughs> they're like you know like how, how do you go about doing a sit spot <laughs> totally thank you um so yeah, so what I teach is what I call is what I was taught is the core routines of nature connection. So there are routines that we find in place-based cultures all over the world that everybody does in some way. They all track animals, they all forage for plants, they all tell their story around a fire right? They all sing, they all dance, they all have an interactive movement practice. And at the core of that is sit spot. And sit spot is this idea that you just go outside and you sit and you observe. It's kind of like, it's kind of like TV, except you don't get to choose what you get to watch, right? Yeah. And yeah, so like even it can be on your porch, right? You want to, I want to make it super easy. Like people are like, oh, I have to like have the perfect sit spot. It's down by a river with a cedar tree on my back and I can see it's south facing. It's in the sun. Da, 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 da. Um, I have people who have sit spots in the city. I've actually seen the most wildlife in the city. Raccoons, mm-hmm. foxes bobcats, um, all kinds of predatory hawks. I've seen the most amount of wildlife in the city. So, and like when I was living in Seattle, my backyard was bumping. There were like birds having babies, making nests. There were jays and crows attacking them, squirrels. It was amazing. And so the encouragement is to go up and find a spot, a spot that you feel comfortable and that you feel safe, and that you can just sit and observe. And like you said, your mind is going to start rattling off the thoughts, and that's okay. And what I welcome you to do to calm that down is to pay attention, is to start noticing what can you notice. Like, are there any trees around you? What kind of trees are those? Maybe you don't know. You can just start asking questions like, oh, wow, like I, I don't actually know what this little plant is. Or, oh, there's a bird. I wonder what that bird is. I wonder what it's doing. And there are ways to find out. Sometimes just watching and listening is going to help you find out. Um, and what I do is I take people through sets of practices to help them find out in kind of a more specific way and the other thing that you can do at your sit spot is you could sit there and just express gratitude Mm. wow like i'm really grateful for the trees and all of the oxygen that they give me like wow i'm really grateful that i live in a place where i can see birds And you can just look around and you could spend that whole time offering your gratitude. You could spend that whole time asking questions like, what can I smell? What's the furthest sound that I can hear right now? What's the closest sound? Are they the same? Right? And it's really about being curious and following that curiosity and that informs you about your environment. Like, oh, like, are those berries edible? And then maybe you look it up mm-hmm. and you find that they're edible. And then you harvest them. So mm-hmm. going to your sit spot and starting to learn about your place. Who are the plants and trees and birds and beings of my place versus like out there? And you can just start and fill mm-hmm. in that little world, which is much detail as possible. And it will have massive benefits for your mental health, your general well-being, and your connection in your stories that you have with that place. That's ultimately, for me, mm-hmm. stories are the most nourishing thing that when I go to a place, I'm like, ooh, 
I, when I was here, I like harvested mushrooms or I found a little junko nest living in my backyard. Or, ooh, I saw a Stellar's Jay actually mm-hmm. eat this little chickadee or a hawk kill the squirrel at my sit spot. It's like in the same way you talk about like what happened at your work or what happened on the TV, you want to have that relationship about your sit spot and you want to share those experiences and all of a sudden you create a high resolution image of your local place Mm -hmm. that is deeply meaningful to you and all you did was just sit and observe Mm -hmm. that's amazing thank you yeah I'll, i'll finish off maybe with giving a quick little story of i guess it's my my sit spot i didn't know that it was that uh, when I was doing it, but in my backyard, I, uh, uh, we don't have a big backyard. It's a small yard and an even smaller patch of dirt there. We didn't want to put grass on there for the small patch of dirt that it'd have to be mowing. So we planted all these, uh, clover seeds and they, you know, burst into life, uh, micro clover. And uh, throughout the summer, you know, they had all these flowers that attracted all these insects, all these honeybees that I'd never seen so many honeybees gather in one place all at once. It was amazing to see, like, you could just step outside and just at a glance see, like, so many honeybees. It was amazing. And then a little bit later in the year, grasshoppers started coming around. And I was like, I've never seen grasshoppers before. This is amazing. (laughs) Yeah, so it's just, uh, I didn't realize I was sit spotting, but I I was. (laughs) Uh, And uh, I didn't, yeah, until I heard you talk about it, I guess. (laughs) But yeah, yeah so and now thank you, have you for that story and that relationship, and that's like, oh, mm-hmm. and that, yeah, mm-hmm. I'm excited to like hear how that grows for you, and yeah, how that expands mm-hmm. into your world. Yeah, thank you for sharing mm-hmm. that. Awesome. So thank you so much for coming on the podcast, for talking to me, for sharing your wealth of knowledge, Kyle. It's been awesome. And uh, I guess if people want to reach out to you, it's a uh, at Trotting Sparrow on Instagram. Is there anywhere else you'd like to direct people to? Um, yeah, that's the best place to find me, TrottingSparrow.com, Kyle at TrottingSparrow.com. Uh, but yeah, if you see me on Instagram, send me a message. I'm super happy to respond and chat to you and uh, yeah, see how we can connect. Yeah, and you're, you're offering certain, um, can you talk about like some of the uh, like experiences you're offering a little bit before we go? Yeah, so I offer retreats. I do retreats with a company called Evolve Move Play um, with Rafe Kelly. And basically, we were pretty booked. We only have a few spots left, but um, May, June, July, August, and September, we will be running four to eight day workshops based around movement and play and roughhousing, mindfulness, and of course, nature connection. We're going to be doing all of the stuff deep in nature and we're going to be exploring different environments from creek running to waterfall climbing to mountains and glissading um, as well as foraging food uh, the whole time. So if you want to come out to a retreat, they're filling up fast and yeah, we'd love to have you um, come and play with us. Wonderful. Thank you, Kyle. All right, Jamar. Take care, buddy. Appreciate you. Thank you, man. Bye-bye. Thanks again for watching or listening till the end of the podcast. If you have any follow-up questions or comments, please reach out and let me clear up any uncertainty. Either leave a comment or send an email to newsletter at jmartfit.com. That's all I have for you today, ladies and gents. Connect with me on social media at jmartfit on Instagram and Twitter and jmartmoves on Facebook. Or get my free bodyweight training program through subscribepage.com slash bodybasics. Jmart out. <laughs>